Let me just say good evening. Welcome to everybody. My name is Bill McLean. I'm a journalist for Reuters, and I'll be moderating this evening's uh, discussion. And uh, the, the subject is detainees in, uh, in Iran. And the way I'd like to propose we organize uh, the business is to um, develop it along two, two related themes. One is to answer the question, what happens to detainees in Iran? What's the human element? What are the testimonies that tell us, uh, tell us the answer to that question? The second, the second element is um, about media. That is, media new and old, and how it can tell these stories in ways which engage audiences interactively, and uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of, of media, media strategies uh, that can be used to, to inform and educate audiences um, about, about the topic. Um, so my first job tonight is to introduce um, the panel who will be taking us through these issues. And um, let me start uh, at, at, the, at the end uh, with, um, with Drury Dyke, who's the Amnesty researcher for, um, who's the Iran researcher for Amnesty International. Um, Drury's been doing the job for, uh, for a decade with, uh, with, a, with a break. And, um, and uh, was last in the country, I think I might, in 2005, 2004, 2004. Um, next to him, we have Sina Motalebi, who is a distinguished Iranian journalist with a particular story to, to tell on this theme. Um, Sina was uh, arrested in 2003 and spent 23 days in solitary confinement. Um, before being uh, released and uh, leaving the country to move to to Europe, um, Sina is is a distinguished journalist. He's a blogger and uh, now works for BBC Persian Service, BBC TV Persian <coughs> Service. And uh, next to him we have um, excuse me, Cindy Hickey, who is here because a year ago, or almost a year ago. Her son, uh, Shane Bauer, was among three uh, hikers who were arrested near, arrested near the Iraqi border by Iranian security forces and taken to Tehran and accused of espionage, uh, but not charged, mm -hmm. uh, and have been held um, since that time virtually incommunicado, I think, with the exception of a visit that you made in uh, in May 2010, May of this year. And uh, Cindy's here to give her, ex her experiences of these two issues, of, of, the, of the experiences, as far as anyone knows it, of uh, her, her child and uh, his fiance and their friend, and the, uh, the media element of it. And then next to her, we have Masia Bahari, who's a Newsweek journalist. Um, who we're very happy to have on the panel at, at the last, last minute, uh, who was arrested on June 21st, 2009, uh, and subsequently spent 118 days in Evin prison. Uh, he was freed on October the 17th, following international pressure from a range of actors, including Hillary Clinton and various media out outlets, including Newsweek, uh, New York Times, and in March 2010, he was sentenced in absentia to 13 years, six months in prison and 74 lashes for unlawfully, not unlawful assemble, un unlawful assembly uh, and a variety of other counts. So that's our panel. Um, I'd like to start by asking uh, each panel member in turn to to really just give us a snapshot on these two issues, a sort of opening statement, if you like, but it sounds a bit too formal, really, but just their opening take on what's going on and how is the media, new and old, coping in developing strategies which can be used to, to highlight, uh, highlight uh, the plight of detainees. So, Drury, could you start us off? 
Thanks, Bill. Um, speaking to your uh, theme, Bill, I think you, I mean you, you've set out two aspects, and I think they're, they're a good way to, to get rolling. Our experience is that what happens to detainees is 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 is, is, is complex. It's it's uh, multifaceted. There, of course, Iran, like every other country, has of course got. Uh, criminals. There are people who commit criminal offences, recognisably criminal offences, and those people are arrested. And uh, uh, often, uh, our experience, they, m in many respects, have less rights and indeed less uh, protection than many political prisoners, high-profile political prisoners that that we work uh, on behalf of. And indeed, some Iranian uh, prisoners of conscience and human rights activists have made that same point. Um, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Imadidin Bahi, for example, has a, a, an NGO that helps protect prisoners' rights, and he himself has said, actually, the, the people who've committed common criminal offences have got less protection than some of us. We have got a name, we have got a profile, and the people who intervene on our behalf. Uh, that's that said. There is, uh, of course, the, our line of work in, uh, and, uh, at Amnesty International, those who are arbitrarily arrested, arrested in, a, in an unfair manner and treated through the administration of justice in, in an unfair way, from the arbitrary arrest to prolonged detention to an unfair trial perhaps preceded by a, uh, uh, a forced confession, a broadcast confession uh, on television, um, uh, which some, uh, some may wish to comment on. Um, and let's go to another category. So I want to be a bit brief. There's uh, categories of people who've been arrested. They haven't really done anything. And in fact, they may be arrested more for who they are than what they were doing. People may be in the wrong place at the wrong time, taking pictures, asking questions in the course of unrest after a presidential election, hiking with friends in a border area, uh, uh, taken. The area, of course, is disputed where they're taken um, and taken maybe you know, to Marivan and on to Tehran. Other people who are arrested and then after which their, their father is arrested in order to extract some leverage on those individuals. And that's a, that's a much more difficult and intractable uh, kind of category of, of people to, to work on. And that brings me to the second point that Bill drew attention to is the medium. How, you know, what, what, how do we work with and get the media to work for what we want to work for? And just by, by, for the sake of argument, I think, uh, for, to get us going, I think our experience broadly is that, uh, whether we like it or not, that the, maybe the more conventional media, print media no less, big newspapers, New York Times, uh, London Times, Guardian perhaps, uh, and, and others, many others too, are uh, important levers to bring about change. They help embarrass the authorities into action. Um, some of the people who've been uh, looking at recent events in respect to Sakine Mohammed the Ashtiani, that Frontline drew attention to a woman who is alleged to have committed adultery and faces stoning, a a very targeted campaign by a group of campaigners targeting specific media outlets and human rights organizations, not to speak of groups like Amnesty, have helped to propel this case uh, so that ultimately it was on the cover of the Times. It was on the cover of El Pais. Um, you know, the, 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 the petitions and the action generated in Spain alone has been enough to put the Iranian authorities on the back foot. And, and that is caused by way of example, a statement from the Iranian authorities, the Iranian embassy in London, to make a statement that actually they weren't entitled to make. So the, there are these levers that, that, uh, that are open to us. And as I say, I think my sense is that, uh, that in many respects, the traditional print media remains an important ally in the fight for human rights. But that uh, doesn't count other levers, which can bring in, that, can, that you can enmesh, I think, um, the stories that that we certainly we fight for, St you know, bringing in the whole question of bloggers. There's a there's still a, a, a this, you know, very active interest in bloggers that the traditional media will pick up, or 
indeed humanitarian stories, stories that, 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 that mean something to the average reader, stoning, adultery, hiking, engagement, uh, birth of a child, these, these resonate and, and have, I think have something to tell um, about some of the panel members and indeed why we're here tonight. Sina Mutalevi, do you take the same lesson that traditional, traditional media like newspapers, television can pack as heavier or heavy, a heavier punch than new media when it comes to <coughs> highlighting, highlighting these stories and stories like yours? <coughs> Definitely, the traditional media are a heavier player in the scene and they can put more pressure on the Iranian government or any government that uh, detain people in an arbitrary matter. But um, what I'm thinking is, uh, you know, in a situation like Iran, when in the course of past uh, last year you have many people who have been arrested and there are am among them some cases which uh, got the media attention, like the case of um, American hikers, for example, in Iran, or the case of Maziar, for example, because uh, he was a Newsweek uh, correspondent and uh, a Newsweek very proactively uh, highlighted the, uh, the case. Uh, but uh, or well-known journalists or politicians who have been arrested, but there were many ordinary people who have been arrested. You know, um, <coughs> I remember three, four years ago when I was. Uh, part of a panel here and my English was as bad as now and I was trying to uh, explain my story and that was somehow an exceptional story and that was an insight like right. what's going on in Iranian prison now my experience is nothing compared to what ordinary people every day uh, you know they are experiencing this is part of the common life experience in Iran you know what are you doing for next weekend I'm going to the beach what have you done last weekend I, I was in every prison you know that's something that Okay. It's not like ordinary life anymore. <coughs> uh, at, at that time, I, I, I remember that, uh, you know, uh, I, I was saying that, uh, um, okay, th th there are journalists, politicians who have been uh, targeted by Iranian government. Now, they are, it is the case of ordinary people. And uh, even in Farsi media, we don't know the names of all, uh, all of those people. Here is where Facebook, social networking, uh, bloggers can uh, come into the scene, you know. Uh, when we monitor blogs and re read the f um, f first hand accounts of people who have just been released from prison and they, they write about their cellmates and, they, and we discover some new names that we never know about and some personal stories and that is a very important thing because uh, both in the eyes of the government and also media, traditional media, uh, people who have been detained, they are uh, reduced to a very short political hard news story. But actually there is a life going on and, and that is the most important part, of, as you mentioned, of the story. And that is where we can uh, put pressure by, by highlighting that. And bloggers uh, can do that very effectively. They can bring in the, the human side of the story and uh, all those personal uh, notions of what's going on, you know. Um, um, and, and in any case, you can find that you know the mothers who are uh, concerned about the children in Iran in a, in a far uh, country. In my case, you know, I had a six-month-old child outside, which uh, I told you, you know, every day I was thinking that I'm missing something that it is irreplaceable. In your case, it was you were very close to missing the birth of your child, and and that side of the story is a thing that bloggers can take out and highlight. Right. So on the one hand, there's a, there's a, if one definition of news is that which is unusual, then traditional media struggles to keep the story alive on that level. But yeah. on the level of new media, there's a whole different level of engagement which is possible through the personal story and the personal yeah. commonalities. If you it like. is about the news values. When you, right. when you are uh, sitting in a newsroom of a uh, traditional media, you want rarity, you have it in the case of right. hikers, you, you want like fame, you have it in the case of some politicians. But the human interest, the best platform to, uh, to use that va uh, news values in the, right. uh, in the new media and social network results. Well, Cindy Hickey, you've, you've um, worked extremely hard, obviously, on the, the new media side of, of uh, your situation. But since you've flown over here from the States to, to be here, I, I really want to ask you just to go over, not necessarily for some of these audiences, but for an online audience who may sure. not be quite up to speed with, with the hiker's story. Just remind us what happened on July 31st, to, 2009, to, to your son, Shane Bauer. Thank you. 
Well, on July 31st, 2009, I get a call from the Baghdad Embassy telling me that my son and his companions are believed to have been taken into custody by Iranian authorities. We don't know any more details. We'll call you back when we have more details. And you can imagine what happened to me. My adrenaline went up, you know, and as a mother, it's like, what am I going to do? This is my adult child. All my children are adults. But as a mother, I want to do something. So I, you know, collected my numbers, called my daughters and Shane's father, and actually called Sarah's mom, Nora, to talk about this, and waited. We, we waited. Um, we then found out. It took actually several days to find out where they were. You know, we knew they were in Iran, but we didn't get a whole lot of details. And I believe it was almost 20 days before we knew they were in a being prison. Um, totally isolated. We didn't get any news. The Swiss couldn't get in, who's our protecting power. No one can give us any information other than that they were in a being prison. And there was sketchy details about the possibility of maybe accidentally crossing a border, and that's all we knew. Today, I know no more about their case than I did on July 31st, 2010. We still have no details. We've hired a lawyer back in December. He has not been allowed to see Shane, Sarah, and Josh. The Swiss now haven't been allowed to see them since April. We were there. The three moms went to see their children back in May. Our visa, of course, was granted for a week after uh, several months of waiting. And you know, as we're boarding the plane, we were told it's only two days. So we did get the opportunity to see them. We were very grateful for that. And one of the things that we were able to fill them with is what we're doing back here. Because when we got there, they thought they had been forgotten. You know, of course, as my son, Shane, knows I'm not going to forget him. But when you're sitting in a cell, and I'm sure others can speak to this much better than I can, in solitary confinement for three months, three to four months, you start to wonder if there's anybody out there. So they have had no, we got one phone call. Mine lasted a minute. We have had no contact with them now since May. No movement in their case, no charges. They haven't been interrogated for over seven months. They're just sitting there. Right. Reading their, their blogs and the, their online presence, um, it seems that they're extremely you know, well-traveled, well-informed, mm -hmm. well-educated, self-aware individuals, uh, curious and, 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 and adventurous. Uh, you know, is there, is there, do, you, do you ever wonder whether they could have been misinformed or whether there was something that they could have done that could have been perceived to have been uh, wrongdoing? You know, I, I, I know that they had been advised by their friends that this was a place to go. And actually, there's travel agencies that advise this as a tourist area and a safe place to go. Shane actually called me a month before and told me he was making plans to go. It was a safe place. That's what he told me. Um, was he ill-advised? Maybe. Were they naive? Maybe. Did he plan on going into Iran? Absolutely not. Do I think my son was doing anything uh, Illegal? Absolutely not. They went on a hiking trip. Um, Shane's a freelance journalist, so he was looking forward to some R&R &R because he had just done a big story in Baghdad, The Shakedown, who, who he wrote for Mother Jones. Um, and he worked on that as journalists in the audience. He worked on it feverishly for a week, so he was ready to have a break. And that's why they went. Do you have any communication with Iranian authorities? We don't personally know. You know, our, of course, our country can't communicate with them either. So we communicate through the State Department. They communicate with the Swiss, who's our protecting power. We have asked for meetings with the Iranian authorities. We have not gotten any. We've written letters. We have had no one-on-one -on -one contact with them. What about your lawyer? Has he or she no, had contact? No, our lawyer, Masoud Shafi, has had no, he's asked many times, can we see, you know, can right. I see Shane, Sarah, and Josh? They've signed uh, permission for him to be their attorney. He keeps repeating the request, and he's been denied. So we have regular meetings with him, but he's really unable to tell us a whole lot because he haven't, hasn't seen them. Well, I want to turn to Mazia, who has an angle on, on this story, I, I think. Um, if you just tell us about your um, 
well, retell your story and uh, and 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 what you what you learned of uh, of uh, Shane Shane and uh, Sarah and Josh's uh, arrival at the prison. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, Shane, Sarah, and Josh, they are victims of multiple sets of factors in Iran. And also, they're victims of the confrontation between Iran and the US. In terms of Iran, uh, unfortunately, they are in a judicial process that they call an interrogator-based judicial process. What your interrogator tells you, I'm not sure if uh, Sina's interrogator told him or not, but my interrogator told me that, and many other people have said that, that the, your interrogator tells you that I am the one who is going to decide about your destiny. It's not your judge, it's not your lawyer, and it's mm -hmm. not even the law. So if you cooperate with the interrogator the way he wants you to, there are at least two possibilities. He's either manipulating you in order to gain something from you. So for example, in my case, they were trying to get me to confess to being a spy. My interrogator kept on telling me that, if you tell us that you're a spy, we're going to release you the next day. I promise you. And I knew that you know, his promise, his promises was you know, as good as you know, any other promises made in the Islamic Republic. So I never did that. And and then uh, maybe, maybe for some of the other people, if they cooperate with their interrogators, that's one. But that is the, one of the main problems of the judicial process in Iran, that, you know, that the interrogator and the people who are arresting you, for whatever reason, they are in charge of your case. Otherwise, I think after one year that the three hikers are arrested, the Iranian government should have put them either on trial, should uh, openly talk about their charges, or at least say something about their cases. Uh, and it's, it's very frustrating for the families. And I think, uh, I mean, uh, you just have to put yourself in the shoes of a mother. That's, it's uh, very frustrating that you hear about from the Minister of Intelligence that, you know, they are spies. Mm -hmm. Then you have this guy who comes out of nowhere. He says that he was kidnapped by the CIA, and then he was uh, putting messages on YouTube, and he says that I was being swapped uh, with these three spies. And, uh, and the Iranian government is not responsible and is not doing anything. Actually, I think it was you who asked me, so what do you think is going to happen to uh, these uh, hikers or th these three prisoners. Uh, and my answer to you at the bar was that if we knew what the Iranian government was going to do, we would not be here talking about it. The Iranian government, in general, in the past 30 years, it's made its MO to make life as unpredictable and as insecure for everyone. The Iranian citizens, the people in the region, the people in the world, and ultimately for themselves. And that is, I think, that's the problem with the Iranian government. They are not sure about what's going to happen to them in the future. So they are very insecure. And they create this insecurity all over uh, the world and the country. I'm sure I didn't answer your question, but I forgot about your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the suggestion is that, uh, I think it's one, of the, one of the suggestions is that the, the three hikers have stumbled into a game of international power politics, uh, you know, and that they are, you know, that's, that's, that's what, what seems to come through if they haven't been charged yet. President Ahmadinejad said in a, an interview in September 09 with NBC, I think, we are ready to act in a reciprocal manner. And Iranian authorities have said in relation to this case, there are former Deputy Defense Minister Asghari and 10 other Iranians who are held by Western intelligence agencies um, who the suggestion is could be uh, uh, engaged with in a reciprocal manner. Um, is, there, is there a deal in the making? Cindy. You know, as mothers, we don't have any idea. You know, we hear what the general population hears. We hear what you hear in the media. 
you know, as far as what we hear from our government, you know, of course they say there's not going to be any swap, there's not going to be a deal. So we feel very powerless. We really feel like this is in the control of the Iranian government and the American government, and our hands are tied. You know, and it's really frustrating for us because this should be treated and done and over with as a humanitarian issue a long time ago. And, you know, the lack of control that, and I'm going to use a mother a lot because the lack of control that a mother has that we can't do anything for our children right now is overwhelming and it's taken over our lives. But if you look at the trajectory of U.S. Iranian relations since uh, November 79, you know, when the embassy was uh, overrun in, in Tehran, detainee issues you know, have, have been a, a perennial factor yes. you know, in, in uh, involving all kinds of third countries uh, in that relationship. Does that actually give you, um, paradoxically, hope that some solution you know, will be found? Some training no, I found. feel like there will be a solution. I would like it to be sooner than later. It's going on a year. You know, there's no charges. There's no movement at all. So I do feel like there will be movement. It's just when will that movement be? And what do we have to do as families to make that movement? And that's why we're out doing what we're doing. Drury, are these cases somewhat anomalous when you have high, high profile or unusual events taking place which uh, lead themselves to you know, international discussions about international power politics, you know, in detailed relations. They, yeah, they do stand apart. They're very difficult to campaign on. They're, um, uh, uh, Maziar's was maybe a bit more straightforward. Um, journalists, many journalists were covering what happened after the elections in June of last year. Uh, many were detained, not least Iranian. Well, I mean, those working for Iranian uh, news outlets and newspapers and so on. Um, they were doing their job and to be arrested for that purpose they were prisoners of conscience. It's a pretty straightforward thing for a group like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and uh, RSF, Reporters Without Frontiers and so on to campaign on. Those are straightforward in a sense. Um, where it becomes more difficult and intractable and, and, and difficult to campaign on are more like the case cases uh, of uh, uh, of Sarah, of, of, of Josh, um, um, you know, the, the hikers, and, and because there is, no, there is no basis on which one can uh, flesh it out. Uh, Mohammad Javad Larajani, the head of the state's human rights organization, was in uh, Geneva for a human rights meeting, and uh, some journalist brought up this whole case of a uh, question of swapping, and he said, oh, no, this is not our way. Well, we should let justice take its course, and um, uh, and so on, but uh, well, justice take its course. Iran's own laws say that you know after a maximum of four months there should be a, a bringing to trial uh, of certain cases in respect to challenging a temporary detention order. Maziar mentioned, and I think it's very true, and one of the classic flaws of the Iranian judicial system is the power vested in the in the boss porse, in the, in the interrogator. I am your man. You, you will deal with me. I will get you out of this. Cooperate with me and you'll be out. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult because it's not that way. And they will not have it. It is a, it is a, a line in the c Code of Criminal Procedures in Iran that you will not have a lawyer until such time as you're charged. Okay, so if you don't charge somebody and the temporary detention order is carrying on, which actually is it really a temporary detention order that is being carried on because we have no way of knowing if it's being challenged. I'd, I'd be surprised if your temporary, so-called temporary detention order was actually ever really a temporary detention order. Right. Come well, on. Basically, yeah, basically my interrogator told me that if you don't fire your lawyer, you're mm -hmm. going to have an even heavier sentence. And you know, he said that this lawyer, we don't like him, so you have to fire him. And then they introduced the lawyer who was going to charge us uh, $60,000 uh, to represent me. So we are uh, talking, to, uh, talking about a very uh, corrupt system and a very kind of secretive system at the same time. One thing about the prisoners in Iran and since 1979 is that uh, Iranian government has a very bazaari mentality, and bazaar is like you know the traditional marketplaces in Iran, and they look at everything as a commodity, 
And they look at things in a very pragmatic manner at the same time. So if the uh, prisoners or if the hostages in Lebanon, in Iran, wherever, they can serve their interests, they keep them. As, as soon as a prisoner or a hostage becomes a liability, like I was, they release that person. So I think the world community should really think about Iranian government in a different light, in a very you know, give and take mentality, and try to make uh, prisoners, hostages, your loved ones who are captive of the Iranian government into liabilities for the Iranian government rather than people who are serving their interest. And there are different ways to do it, and you know, media is part of it. But I think it's very important to consider this very cynical, pragmatic uh, characteristic of the Iranian government. Just on the question of arresting powers, just for anyone in the panel, who are the most powerful of the security forces who carry out this, these activities? Is it the besiege? Is it the IRGC? Is it, uh, are there other uh, groups as well? Or do they all carry this, this uh, power? Well, besiege is part of IRGC, it so, is. yeah, uh, so. In, uh, yeah. It is different now, you know, in, before the uh, election, the first election of Ahmadinejad, there was a parallel security force in Iran, and they carried out some of the arrests, like my, my arrest was, I was not arrested by intelligence ministry, I was arrested by those parallel security forces, but now they became mainstream and part of the government. But the basics of that remain the same since 1980s until now. You know that what uh, Maziar mentioned is, is is the key to the experience of the prisoner, and it doesn't matter how long you have you stayed there or uh, how strong they are, the, the ones who kept you. The lack of control on your fate and uh, the total absolute control of the interrogator. That is. That is the issue. Um, I remember one time, you know, I never was a religious person, but I was there and I was weak. And after like two, three weeks, you know, in the, my last week, I started to pray. I said, okay, this is the only way, you know, God only can take me out of this uh, solitary confinement. So I started praying and I couldn't remember all the prayers. So the easiest one, I was repeating that. And one day they left me some questions I didn't answer. Next day, he asked me, why you didn't answer the question? I said, I didn't have time. And I said, what were you doing in a solitary confinement uh, that made you peasy? I said, I was praying. I said, don't pray. God cannot take you out of this prison. I can do it. So, yeah. <laughs> and that was Islamic Republic. Uh, I wrote that in an open letter to Hashem Shahrudi, who was head of Syria at the time. And, uh, but that is the reality. You know, I, um, as soon as you get to these secret prisons, uh, and go to solitary confinement, the first thing that you are cut off from is information. You will not get any information from outside world, and outside world will not get any information from you, except through the interrogator. So it is not like physical torture or psychological torture that gives him absolute power. Uh, the access to information is what makes him powerful. So, you know, I had to make him happy to let him uh, to give me a chance to have a phone call with my wife, you know. They would give me some news about my son being ill and I had no chance to contact home for 48 hours, so he had to approve the, the permission for me to just have a phone call and, and hear from my wife that my son is not in the hospital. That gives him the absolute power there, even above the power of the judge or anybody else. And the same thing happened to me. I had to fire my lawyer, the lawyer that was uh, taken for me by the Union of Iranian Journalists. And I, uh, I met the lawyer. I had to fire him. Then they put a bail for me. Instead of uh, you know, telling me that this, is, this much is your bail, put it and go out, they put a paper in front of me that I had to sign and say I can not afford paying the bail. So I was on bail, but still in jail because because that was the way they wanted. And, and uh, the same thing happened, you know, they said, cooperate with us. And I cooperated. I said, okay, I, I was a spy for any organization you want, you know, just name it. And I was still there. I, I wrote like 300 pages of confessions and I was still there. And they were asking questions like, what is the midterm plan of US forces in the region? I said, I have been here for three weeks. I don't know what's going on outside. So one day I stopped writing. 
And I said, well, I don't have any more information. <laughs> and after 48 hours, I was released. So that is the thing, you know, I had no, no other purpose. They couldn't take anything more from me, and there was uh, some pressure on them. You know, Mazia wrote in Newsweek about my case. Bloggers started, I was the first blogger arrested, and then it gave it rarity, and there was a, uh, you know, movement in bloggers put some pressure, and there was nothing more. I, I, I couldn't <coughs> write confessions about George Bush or others, so they just released me. So it's a game, but nobody, uh, nobody can teach you the rules of the game because nobody knows the rules of the game. It is they, just they like, it in, yeah, yeah, it is just like improvising, and you have to spend the time you are uh, you have in the solitary confinement to think about the game, think about different scenarios, how I can interact with these people and come out. But because the main thing in that control, absolute control, is information. That's where I think if, uh, the media can uh, come to the to, to the play because. We are the ones who can change the balance uh, in, in this game by providing information to the outside. But how, but how many people proportionately are held in solitary as opposed to normal incarceration with, with other prisoners? Is, is it, it's impossible to know. It's impossible. Absolutely to know. impossible to know. Right. Because some of the solitary confinement rooms are full of prisoners. They've made them into criminal cells. Right. And some bigger cells, uh, they are given to a VIP prisoner. So it's, right. it's very difficult, you know, you don't exactly, I mean, as sure. Sina says, it's very difficult to know what is the thinking at that time. And I think it's important to, for the people to know that Sina was arrested in 2003, but there was uh, this internal fighting, uh, infighting mm. within the Iranian government. And the uh, president of the country at that time was the head of the opposition. And you know, people like me, we could write about Sina's case and you know, come and go to Iran and you know, we were not bothered. And you know, we were even uh, supported by the Iranian Ministry of Culture. But since uh, last year, I mean, somehow since Ahmadinejad's election in 2005, but especially since last year, the Revolutionary Guards uh, took over the government. And they are in, a, in the process of consolidating their power and taking total control of the country, of every aspect of the country, every major institution of the country. Of course, they started with the nuclear program first, but then they moved to intelligence organization, right? At the time when Sina was arrested in 2003, they used to call uh, the Revolutionary Guards uh, Intelligence Division right. the Parallel Division. Right now, many high-ranking members of Revolutionary Guards, they've taken over Ministry of Intelligence. Or they forced the people in Ministry of Intelligence to obey uh, their demands. Because again, after all, all these people they are employees, and you know they have to make a living. Mm -hmm. So an intelligence official, a professional intelligence official, is no different from an accountant. He has to make a living. So if these, if he is ordered by the revolutionary guards, he listens to the revolutionary guards. If he is ordered by a reformist politician, he listens to a reformist politician. But the, the revolutionary guards, since last year, they are in charge of the country. Uh, let's say. 75%, 80%, and they are in the process of consolidating. So it's maybe easier in a way to deal with Iran right now than it used to be before, because you know who you are dealing with. But still, it's a very complex situation. It's with very complicated inside, yeah. because one of the things that I can uh, you know, say as an example is when uh, I left Iran, my father was arrested, and they kept him in solitary cell for 10 days. Uh, the, at the time, I was a political refugee in Holland. So right. uh, Holland was head of EU, and they put a lot of pressure on Iro uh, Iran. And he was released very soon. And there, again, there was a media pressure on Iran. It was a very rare case, family detention. It was high-profile case because of family detention. And uh, he was released, fortunately, after 10 days uh, or two weeks. Uh, but. Uh, I remember that at the time I was not working with BBC uh, and uh, when, for example, BBC or other media organization contacted me, I couldn't uh, provide an evidence and say, to say that my father is arrested just because of my case. So 
technically he is taken hostage yeah. to put pressure on me. It was very difficult to provide that evidence because it was a rare case at the time. Uh, it's now not that rare anymore. But uh, what happened was the vice president of Iran, who has been arrested uh, after, after election, uh, Mr. Abtahi, he wrote in his blog about my father's case. And he said, this is a case of family detention. So all the media outlets, they, they quoted him. You cannot imagine that, you know, that now a vice president come and say that. So it was helpful for media to, to have some people to contact and get information or get confirmation about the cases. You don't have those contacts in Iran anymore. Sure. I mean, you, we were talking about this consolidation of power you know, in, the, in the state, um, but, but you're also saying that this consolidation, in effect, extends into cyberspace uh, or, or to a certain no. extent. Well, that's my question. To, to what extent is, is this, um, is this um, element of power seeking to to <coughs> gain uh, control through, through one way or another of, of the blogging community or Gerdob. the online community. Gerdob. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it strikes me that, that, that it, it, the, the need to control by the Revolutionary Guards is absolute. Uh, the, the trend that, uh, that, uh, that Mazar has, has referred to is, is so advanced now. At the very end of President uh, Khatami's rule, there was a, the opening of the Imam Khomeini airport. And on the day of the opening, the Revolutionary Guards had uh, decreed that it was, couldn't be opened, that the consortium of Turkish and Austrian contractors that had built the facilities, they were a security risk, the Turks had connections to Israel, and actually, it wasn't about that at all. It was about having the contracts to supply the oil and supply the goods and the and the and the, and the produce and so on being sold within the within the confines of the airport. And that's 2006. Now 2010, we're moving on. Yes, it's true. We do, in a way, know who we have to ultimately deal with. Um, the the caveat, I guess, that I, I that that I would put in. With at least some of the cases, maybe some of the non-political cases, is that there are good judges, there are good lawyers, there are people who do want to do their job and do their job well. I, mean, I was in an antechamber of the head of the judiciary's office talking to a judge in, in a time when judges were still required to be the investigator, the prosecutor, and the judge of the case, a law that they subsequently changed and and they, they were saying, some of the judges uh, were sitting with us were saying oh no look we're knackered we can't carry on doing this it's got to change we're telling the authorities this has to change and there is some upward pressure there is some signs that the head of the Tehran judiciary is somebody who's going to work for some of these cases um, but that's not all and that's not where uh, that's not where Josh Sarah and Shane are kept and that's not where uh, Mazio was kept, that's not where Sina's dad was kept, um, and yeah, we need to address them. And I think that, you know, kind of going back to your second strand about, about showing that it is a liability to keep holding the three, Mazio, the, it, it, I think it takes all strands. I think it takes a Facebook campaign. I think it, it strikes me that it takes the, the petition the online petition that, in the, at least in the end, if it's chaperoned through a system and made something out of it, um, it is the image of people knocking on doors and being turned away, of humanitarian efforts, of in Maida Vale, the Supreme Leader's representative, uh, Moizi, uh, being told to, uh, at least being called upon to take a, 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 an interest in some of these cases. Um, you know, they, they're multifaceted and, and it builds a package which at the end they'll say, no, Mazi al-Bahari has got to be released in order to see the birth of his child. Have the authorities taken a leaf out of the bloggers' books and started blogging themselves? So it's right, but pardon my ignorance, but I just, I just don't know. Is there, is there a counter-offensive, a counter as it were, if I can use that term? Well, I don't think that we can really, I mean, again, we cannot talk about authorities, but as Drury said, uh, the cyber war or cyber jihad that the Iranian, some, uh, that the Revolutionary Guards have started 
it's quite sophisticated in terms of the technology. Mm -hmm. They have hired the best uh, Russian technicians, as far as I know. They have Chinese technology. They're working with some even American companies. So in terms of technology, they're quite savvy and they're quite knowledgeable. The problem with the Revolutionary Guards, even though they are quite technologically savvy, is that they are not in, well informed about what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. and they're very paranoid. So you have this uh, disconnect between their technolo technological knowledge and their general knowledge about the world. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that is a very dangerous area. That is a very dangerous area because it creates paranoia, it creates fear among the re uh, revolutionary guards, it uh, makes them suspicious of anything. I mean, I always give an example of, and you know, this is one of my charges. Uh, I was, uh, one of my uh, sentences is six months uh, imprisonment because of a photo of Ahmadinejad that someone tagged on my Facebook. And you know, as people know about Facebook, you have no control over who tags whatever mm -hmm. on your Facebook. And it shows Ahmadinejad kissing a boy, and they said that you're implying that the president is a homosexual, so you're insulting. And then you have six months imprisonment because of that. Mm -hmm. So it shows the kind of ignorance about the content of the world, but uh, technological. One thing also about the media, and also about the general media, and events like this is that I, mean, I can talk about my own personal experience that the prisoner even if uh, you're in solitary confinement whatever people do for you you somehow feel it on a personal level I'm not a very spiritual new age kind of person but uh, actually I'm very I don't believe in any of those spiritual ideas but I was feeling that people were supporting me somehow mm. when I was in solitary confinement. And as Sina said, I had no communication whatsoever with the rest of the world. And the other thing about the Iranian government uh, that people should consider is that it's not like North Korea. It cares about people's opinion of the country. So Mr. Larijani, you know, who studied in Berkeley and pretends to be an intellectual, and actually he once told me that to him, the best art is dance because you have to move all parts of your body. And you know, <laughs> he is uh, someone who cares about the rest of the world and what the rest of the world thinks of him uh, uh, and his country. And that's why he goes out of his way uh, in order to justify the stupid actions of uh, his country, his leaders. Ahmadinejad is the same thing. He tries to somehow rectify. but. Everything's entangled in this power struggle inside Iran. And you know, I have to clarify again that the Revolutionary Guards are in the process of consolidating their power. They will not be able to consolidate their power because of different historical and uh, social reasons and political reasons in Iran. But they are in the process of doing that. And there will be a lot of victims in that uh, process. About this cyber war, I think uh, the technology is very sophisticated. But uh, since a few years ago, you can see there is uh, some action so in, in the content providing front also. So it is not just blocking some of the blogs or websites that are right. providing the content which is not desirable for the government, but also <coughs> providing some false information. And uh, it is not just propaganda for Islamic uh, government. It is. Uh, websites that pretend to be oppositions, web bloggers who pretend to be oppositions, and they are providing um, content that can, uh, somehow I can say, pollute the flow of information with lots of false information, false claims. For example, I can say from the experience we had uh, uh, for covering the uh, events of Iran after election, you know, we had to rely. Uh, on a user generated material and the most difficult uh, task we had was not uh, accessing those uh, material the material was there right. loads it was verifying the material and it said, you know from both sides from the hardliner oppositions and the government supporters of government at least I can say you would receive some materials which were fake you know the, the, the pictures of uh, 
you know, the war in other uh, or riots in other parts of the world. And um, some people wanted to manipulate the media by showing that, you know, accelerating the movement in Iran. Some other who were supporters of government were waiting for you to put that on air and say, okay, CNN, BBC, others, look, all their stories are fake. And, uh, and you have to be very careful about that. And that's where traditional media can be effective. Because uh, what traditional media can do is use blogosphere and uh, social networking uh, websites as a tool to gather information, but then verify the information and transmit it back to the people who have no idea where, uh, what these social networking sites are. And that was what, uh, for example, our interactive program in Persian TV was, uh, is doing. You know, uh, there is a, a part of the program which looks into the blogs and social networking websites and uh, verify the reports, uh, look at the stories, and then transmit it back to the faraway provinces where people have no idea wh where these websites are. But I can say, uh, you know, because it is not like there are some uh, uneducated, stupid people who are just supporting the government. There are intelligent people there, too, who know how to use the media, how to manipulate the media. And the, uh, the task of verifying those uh, stories and uh, finding the genuine content is becoming more and more difficult now. At this point, I'd like to uh, get, get to questions from the floor, get a bit more interactive uh, for the last, uh, last session. So. Um, Please, uh, we invite your, your questions. Go ahead. My name's Andrew Sampson, and I'm from an organization called Safe World, which my wife here um, founded. We've actually been um, uh, helping the mums for the last four or five months, and actually tears came to my eyes just now when I heard all you guys talking about you know supporting Cindy and everything because this is what we've been trying to do for the last five months to get people to listen to them. Now I've got one question. When we got involved, it was about seven months into into the detainment of Sarah Shane and Josh, and and what was happening over in the states was the media had lost interest. Basically, all the media over there wanted to know was what's the news, and when there wasn't any news. They didn't report it, so there was no coverage. So th the interest in what was happening with Sarah, Shane, and Josh what was zilch. And so the families were always having to create news to try and get in the media to get attention to them. Now, what, what does one do in a situation like this? I'm asking the panel generally. When a story is like mature, you know, it's like when, when these guys have been in prison for seven months, how do you stop it going flat? And especially in the case when you're just three mums, you know, with your brothers and sisters doing it, you haven't got a big media company behind you or anything. Yet you're just on your own doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'd just like to say this task of keeping the media interest is a full-time plus job. And it's not just by one of us, it's by all of us. So, you know, the biggest peaks in our media is, of course, when Iran makes an announcement, then our phones are really busy. So, and we feel very, I really feel very strongly that putting pressure on the regime, eventually they'll say, this is more than we want to deal with, and it's, it's too much of a bother for us. That's what we have control over as families, a little bit of control. So that's what our focus is. And that's why, you know, again, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I want as much information about how to keep it in the media as possible. Look, I would say, uh, and we've had conversations about this before, in, is uh, your, you know, the use of Twitter, for example. I've seen, I think Sarah uh, Short's got a Twitter account. Somebody's using it. I don't know who's uh, sending the tweets out on in her name. Uh, that's you, yes, OK. Um, and to highlight certain aspects. It's Sarah's birthday today. It's Josh's birthday today. You know, Josh really likes mountain climbing. Josh really supported the Palestinian people. <laughs> Shane's article in uh, whatever newspaper it was about, uh, I don't know, Palestinian detainees came out a year ago. Reread it. I think there's little snippets that one can take and one should use and one should campaign with and, 
you know, I think Twitter's a place, you know, you're, 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 you're tweeting. Uh, it, it, um, link through to the other places and like, pull out those individual bits. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, you know, the issue of family detention, the issue of families, the, the resonation, the, you know, how important that is. Um, you know, your birthdays, your condition, uh, how are you? How are you coping? How are you feeling? Um, you know, it's a huge, there's a human story and to prize out individual bits of it I think is the key to build a multi-layered kind of a patchwork of humanity that sets in stone. Shane's a human being. Does, does, do those lessons apply to, um, to Iranian detainees and Iranian blogs and so forth? I mean, is, does that follow through into? Yeah, I think uh, when, when a story is old and just because of its uh, you know, recency you cannot uh, cover it, as a journalist, you have to be creative, find an angle and cover it. And as a campaigner, you have to be creative and find an angle and give it to journalists who just are waiting for an interesting uh, story to cover and don't want to spend that time to find a new angle. Uh, I can give an example of uh, one of the most overlooked uh, detainees in Iran in the past uh, last year is Hossein Derakhshan. He was. Uh, the first Iranian blogger, he was very well known, and then before going back to Iran, he, he, he had a sudden change in his uh, political beliefs, and he started supporting Ahmadinejad. He went back to Iran, then he got arrested because what he wrote before changing his beliefs. And uh, because before uh, leaving uh, UK, he put something in his blog and said, nobody has the right to defend me. I, you know, I, I'm suspicious of all you human rights activists. You are just you know, you are working for imperialism and I don't want you to defend me. So nobody defended him. And in Persian TV, we were not launched at, uh, we have not been launched at the time, so we missed the story. We were in the piloting stage. We had a story about him, but nobody saw that because we were in the piloting stage. We missed the story and after a few months, when the family were not talking to anybody because they were advised by their son to don't, do not talk to media. So there was no information coming out. Nobody could cover it. After a few months, when the family started to co contacting media, it was an old story. Nobody could cover it. So for example, about this story, what we did in our interactive program again, uh, we started the covering a recently launched blog of his family members who are writing about his personal stories and uh, republishing some of the old posts of his uh, now vanished blog. And, and we used that and talked about that, so we recreated the story. I remember the time when I was arrested. They told me that, you know, nobody cares about you. So many journalists have been arrested. There is no story about them in, in, in the recent years because it's, it's every, you know, it's, it's become like an everyday story. Nobody cares about that. And they were, that was true, you know, nobody cared about, and now there are Iranian journalists who have been arrested. What, for example, Maziar did in Newsweek was, looking at the story from a different angle. Now, forget he's, uh, about uh, Sina being a journalist. He's a blogger, and that was a new thing. So it gave it another angle. So I think personal stories can help. You know, starting a movement in social media and, and blogs can help. So for example, if one day, I don't know, tens of blogs, American blogs, decide to uh, post one of your son's article instead of their own post, <coughs> and that as a, as a sign of, you know, uh, sympathy to, to the situation. That can be a story that media can cover. So they are not writing about an old story, they are writing about something just happened yesterday mm -hmm. in the blog. So those kind of things can, yeah. can be very helpful. The, the, the Shahram Amiri case must have li lifted the, the, the speculation yeah, attendant upon the Shahram Amiri case. Mm -hmm. Must have lifted the story. Yes, it did. And actually, I just got a report that even Shane's blog site, shanebauer.net, I just got a report from the web designer that said everything really peaked during that time. So we've seen that pattern. When anything happens, things peak, they come and they go. It's the period of going that we want to keep yeah. it alive. Mm. I think it's a big problem, I mean, because I've been campaigning for other Iranian journalists who are imprisoned in Iran. And uh, more than 100 journalists have been arrested. I mean, some of them are uh, out on furlough, and some of them are still inside. 
And it's a very difficult uh, job to keep a campaign. I mean, I was lucky that I had the resources of Washington Post Company and Newsweek uh, behind me. You know, everyone was using their contacts, their money. There was one person who was getting a full, uh, you know, his full-time job, you know, and he was getting paid to, to campaign for me. And it's a very, I mean, it's very difficult. But I think organizations like Frontline Club, other organizations, they have to make the, uh, I think they have to uh, make it one of their goals to make the unknown journalist uh, known. And I'm not sure whether uh, Frontline Club is doing that or not, but that's an idea. And you know, you have to generate stories. And it's very difficult to generate stories sometimes because you have <coughs> uh, Haiti, earthquake in Haiti, and then you have the uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and you have all that. And then you have prisoners who are not known, and people that you know, I've been there for a long time. And the other thing that I, I personally think that's very important is the use of stars. And you know, in my case, I was lucky again that you know, that Penn International, Newsweek, you know, they had Tom Friedman, Umberto Eco, Paul Oster, you know, to write petitions for me, and right. that was. But and I mean, just look at this. I mean, if we had John Simpson talking about his uh, vacation right. in south of France, this uh, session would be sold out. But as now, it's not sold out. So. I think we have to have, yeah, it would be sold out. Yeah, whenever he shows up, it's sold out. Okay. And that. <laughs> Please go ahead. The lady in the, in the green shirt. Hi, yes. Hi. Um, I have a question for the panel. Given that the, the hikers are American in Iran, and one of the things, Mazia, you were saying, that actually Ahmadinejad never really does care what other people think. I think it's difficult for Cindy and Nora and Sean to have, to, to get support inside Iran, given that so many people are arrested in Iran, and you know people can say, well, I've lost my father, I've lost my sister, three Americans. But do you have any advice for them on how inside Iran there could also be pressure put? Does that make sense? I mean, since we met on Sunday, last Sunday, I've been trying to put Iranian media outside of Iran, of course, in touch with uh, the mothers and Sean. And uh, I think that's the only way to uh, get in touch with the Iranians inside Iran, because the government, as Sina said, tries to control information. So. The media inside Iran, if they write something that's uh, against the government's official line or different official lines about the hikers, they can be accused of acting against the national security. There might be even a National Security Council uh, uh, communicate with the different uh, editors of newspapers that you should not write about <coughs> this. Because in different cases, that's what happens, that you know, National Security Council of Iran uh, sends a message to all the editors that you cannot talk about the nuclear issue. And no one does because they know that they can be incarcerated, their newspaper shut down, their livelihoods uh, abrupted. So uh, I think the mothers, they should talk about uh, the case with uh, Iranian publics through Iranian blogsphere through BBC Persian, through uh, And I I Iraq? Any contacts? I mean, this one journalist actually suggested that part of the campaign should be putting pressure on some key people in Iraq, very sympathetic to Iran. I don't know if that's a ridiculous idea well, or not. It can be a good idea, but you know, there are so many good ideas that I don't think we have time to go through all of them here. But in terms of being contact, being in touch with the Iranian public, I think going through like our uh, one of the most prominent Iranian journalists in Blogsphere, Masih Alinejad, uh, had an interview with uh, Nora the other day and she got some comments and eventually I think, uh, I think a lot of Iranians are sympathetic to the plight of the hikers and 
I think you cannot not be sympathetic to the plight of mothers uh, having their children in prison, where, whatever is your nationality. And I think because uh, many Iranian mothers, they have their children in Iranian prisons, they are concerned about that too. Yeah. And I think one, sorry, one thing that we've learned too is, you know, in the beginning, of course you can imagine we had no idea where to start, is when they start telling us to be quiet, because that's happened a couple of times, that's good. I think you know when when the Iranian authorities start passing a message through the Swiss ambassador that they don't like what we're saying. I feel like we're making progress then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things that Newsweek, for example, started with uh, with me was that they didn't want to talk about uh, my case because they were advised by Iranian mission in the UN in New York that let's try to uh, you know not to make too much noise about Maziar. He has some friends in the government. They will, uh, you know, they will release him soon. And after three or four weeks, Newsweek got a message from another part of the government that if you don't talk about him, they think that the charges of espionage is actually correct, and you know that's going to be counterproductive. So then they made a noise that maybe they had to make earlier on. So. And the other, I think uh, the lesson here is that no one has been released because people have been quiet about that person. But there are many prisoners who are released because of uh, media campaign or some sort of deal. And actually, in the past few years, the main reason for the release of prisoners have been media campaign, not lobbying. Yeah. But because there, there is no different parts of government that yeah. you can lobby with. And uh, in Maziar's case, I, I knew that because I was in touch through a, a friend that, okay, they, don't, they didn't want the family, didn't want to talk, the, the news uh, advice them to do that. But my view was it is very important to make it a personal story, write about all these personal stories. Because one of the things is Maziar is right, they care about. Uh, their uh, believers and followers and because most of the people who are supporting them is not just because of their interests it's because of a belief in an ideology and then the stories like this is very contradictory to all those beliefs so for example one of the things that they do uh, one of the first things they do is uh, they try to force you to confess to some on a, uh, ethical charges. So you are drinking alcohol, you have some outside marriage, uh, sexual relationship, things like that that can be presented to, the, to their supporters. And at, you know, at the time that I was arrested, be presented to the other part of the government, like Khatami and, uh, and uh, the, the, um, the reformist part of the, uh, the, the establishment that, okay, these people are not nice, good people who are just fight, uh, you know, writing uh, for, for, for uh, about freedom or other things. So th these are people who are unethical and things like that. That means they are uh, they care about that, and you could see that. You know, as Maziar said, it is not just a spiritual thing. When you are uh, sitting in an interrogation uh, session, you c you could see that in in the act of your interrogator, in his attitude, that he is now frustrated, and you could. Pick that up by saying, okay, contact your family, tell them to be quiet, you know, okay, so somebody's supporting me outside. That's the reason they are asking them to be quiet. Go ahead. I have a question for um, Cindy. When you went to Tehran, I think in May, you, were, you saw them for about a couple of hours in, I think, a Seklal Hotel? Yeah, we actually... And can you just t t tell me what happened there? Because I've seen a clip sure. in which a journalist asked them do they regret mm -hmm. entering Iran? And at one point, I think Josh says that he never entered Iran. And if you could just explain sure. what happened around that two hours, what media outlets were there, who asked the question, or, sure. I mean, did Josh tell you anything, or uh, the others tell you anything about what, uh, about that specific comments by yeah. Josh, please. It was actually Shane that made that was, comment. Oh. Um, he was asked, you know, there we, we got there, and there was a press conference a few hours after we initially got to see Shane, Sarah, and Josh. Um, you know, we had uh, a lot of media there. And, and the two days, there's some things that are really hard for me to even remember. But, you know, 
we had AP there, we had uh, BBC there, we had ABC there, we had some of the American corporate networks. There were a lot of media there. There was also press TV there. Press TV was there all the time. Um, you know, and when they were, they got the opportunity to ask questions in the press conference, that was one of the questions is, do you regret walking into Iran? And Shane said, we never walked into Iran. But we can't talk about that. Because they have been told that they can't talk about their case when the Swiss come and visit them. They can't talk about their case when we're there. So that it was a very controlled environment. Um, you know, and if you've seen the Nation article, the five-month investigation, the Nation is a very reputable publication, and it fills some pretty significant holes in my mind about what may have happened at that border. I mean, didn't you ask anything about that comment? I mean, surely when he said, oh, we never enter Iran, you must have, as a mother, you know, asked them, what, what, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe they couldn't talk to the media about what happened mm -hmm. on that day, but you must have asked something yeah. at these three guys that, yeah. what do you mean? And Shane said, and I did ask him, of course, you know, that was one of my biggest questions when I got there, is what happened at the border? That's been a big question for us. Shane said they were pulled, they were waved across the border. I mean, they told us that, that they were drawn across the border, and they were done, that, it, that was done under force. Right. But isn't the devil's advocate, I suppose, but isn't that area extremely, um, well, it's a banal comment, but it's extremely sensitive. You've had these reports of Pajak, insurgents coming over, and, and uh, a report in the New Yorker that one or two of these insurgent groups have links to U.S. Uh, and Israeli um, uh, secret services and so on. Is that, is that a, a part of the context which, which helps to flesh out this picture, or is it, is it irrelevant? You know, as far as, you know, why were they there? Again, it was told, there's actually tourist uh, companies that promote this area, so that's what they went on. They went on the advice of their friends, too. There hasn't been re any real activity in that area for, I believe, 20 plus years. Um, were they naive? Maybe. You know, to be in that area. I don't know. You know, I'll know more when Shane is home, but, you know, I, Shane's not a uh, senseless traveler by any means. He's been all over the Middle East. He's been traveling there for 10 years, so. Does that answer your question? Gentlemen, just here in the front row. Thanks. Um, I don't. I don't want to change the subject. Uh, I don't mean to be insensitive, and I, I, I really do feel for your plight, and I do hope that all all three uh, of them do come back home safely and very soon. Uh, I just wanted the panel to comment on uh, Sakine Muhammad um, Ashtiani's, uh, um, you know, uh, situation. Uh, yeah, and, and the legislation associated with stoning to death as a punishment and how even how it is meted out, there is, it is discriminatory in terms of uh, the, the gender difference between how the, 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 the sentence is meted out. Yeah. I wondered if, uh, if, if all three of you could comment on it uh, because uh, that, that was something that, I, that was also one of the things that I was hoping would be discussed today and um, so that would be really helpful. I think it would be. Yeah, I, I mean, where do you start? It's uh, um, the UN committee that deals with torture as identified. I think it goes without saying any method that is used to punish somebody that it you know is intentionally causes pain and so on is a form of torture. And I don't think uh, uh, there's any question that laws that stipulate that rocks have to be within a certain parameter, not too small to be considered pebbles, not so large to be considered boulders, for example, just right that they're intended to, you know, inflict as much pain as possible. Um, it's torture. It's a form of torture. It is meted out to men. It, uh, they're, they're, the men are a recipient of this punishment, uh, much less. It is a discriminatory uh, punishment in practice. I was struck a couple of years ago, I think it was 2007 or so on, when Mohammed Javad Larejani, the head of the government's, uh, the, the state's human rights organization, he said, uh, uh, 
as I recall, it is uh, not an incongruous punishment for the crime. Um, and he referred to uh, its leniency. You know, it's, it's a more lenient punishment because the person can get away. But actually, in practice, come on. Um, it, uh, they don't. Uh, yeah, sure, maybe there have been, but it's, um, it's a grotesque punishment and uh, maybe it goes without saying that the, the, the emails and contacts, Skype, uh, Facebook uh, uh, messages we receive from so many, I mean really countless numbers of Iranians inside Iran uh, express absolute disgust and um, a, a complete distancing themselves from this punishment. It's a more complex case than what I think has been aired. It's a case um, originally came to light because of murder. The f uh, two other people that were alleged to have taken part in the murder of her husband have been granted rezayat or satisfaction by members of the family. They've in effect been let off. She needs to serve, a, I think it's a 15 year uh, a prison sentence because of her status as an accessory to the crime um, that is being served. Um, I spoke to the lawyer in Tabriz the other week and he says that the judiciary in East Azerbaijan province has written to the head office, the, the head of judiciary in Iran and said, you know, actually we'd like to change this stoning verdict into a hanging one. And uh, obviously, it's, uh, it, it, in, in our view, um, consensual sexual acts uh, should not be the subject of criminal uh, prosecution. It does not amount to a recognizably international, an internationally recognizable criminal offense in our view. Um, uh, doesn't say that it should not be looked at in a civil uh, case, as many countries recognize that angle. Um, it, uh, it beggars belief. It's an utterly grotesque uh, situation. <coughs> what we understand is that there will not be a reaction from the head of judiciary to the head of East Azerbaijan judiciary's request for give or take a month. That said, there are some news reports tonight that uh, the other lawyer working on the case, a guy called Mohammed Mustafa, he has been summoned to, for uh, questioning at Evian Prison. I don't know what it's about. I, I just heard it as I was coming in uh, tonight. That's very worrying. This is a, a lawyer, an activist lawyer in the country who's taken up questions and issues of uh, juvenile offenders and indeed this case. So uh, the, the threat remains to her life and indeed others. And indeed others. We, we by our estimation, there are eight men, sorry, eight women and three men who are at risk, that is to say, the Supreme Court has passed their verdicts and they are subject to being actionable, to, to be transferred to the Office of the Implementation of Verdicts. Um, they haven't been, and it's one that we follow very carefully, very co closely, we have, a, we have an action on it now. Uh, it's one that's attracted a lot of attention and it's one that has forced the Iranian authorities on the back foot, in part because of a, a campaign initiated through some of the new media that we've been discussing. Um, and I think it's one that all of us will keep a, an eye on uh, very, very carefully. The fact that it happens in Tabriz, in an area that's outside the center, means, I think, uh, that there will be less scrutiny of it. And I think that's a reason that uh, all of us, I think all people interested in the media, media events in Iran, um, and the sort of conduct of such, you know, such matters. We need to look at the provinces more quite carefully than we have in the yeah. past. What's happening in Shiraz, in Mashhad, in uh, smaller places? I mean, the, it's, it's notable that these other cases have happened in places like Takistan. It's a very small place southwest of uh, Iran. So, you know, it's not what we've come to talk about here tonight, but certainly one that we keep an eye on very carefully with the other activist lawyers and interested parties in the country. Bill, do you mind? I, I just want to finish the answer. Can I do that? Sorry. Go ahead. Um, the, you know, the one thing I want people here to understand is we were very monitored during this visit. We didn't have any time alone. So to get details from our children about anything, you know, the conversations we had were, you know, some of them were in hugs and whispers. 
because we were very monitored. So we couldn't get big details. I couldn't get distinct details from Shane about the border crossing. Can, can I just go kind of rejoinder on something that I think we've all kind of touched on? Um, these prisoners we know about. Uh, it's something that Maziar said when he was released in a Newsweek. There was a Newsweek article, and it's it's been a, a real inspiration for us uh, at Amnesty. And it's one particular line in the Newsweek article he wrote about you know it's the worst nightmare of a prisoner to be forgotten. And I mean this is where you're at when you're in solitary. This is you know uh, you know where Sarah must have been at when uh, others will have been at to be alone in this place and so what we have tried to do is to kind of turn that on its head and we are we we've selected six cases of people that we do know about who've got a story Majid Tavakoli, uh, Zia Nabavi, uh, Ahmad Zaidabadi, journalists, human rights defender Shiva, Ahari Naz uh, Nazar Ahari and so on and people who are kind of relatively known and what we're trying to say is is that you know look everybody here's six cases we know about these people but what about Zendani Yone Gomnam? What about these prisoners without a name? Who are they? And luckily, luckily, uh, and you know, pursuant to this whole question about making a noise about uh, some of these cases, and this is what we're saying to people. Say, so don't shut up. Tell a lawyer, tell your MP. You, you should have a right. Speak up for your rights in your own country. And a few people, thank goodness, have come forward to say, yeah, you know, Abedini Nas, my, my son was a mate of his. So we are getting some traction, a little bit of traction from this campaign. A little bit, a little bit. We've used six, and uh, as far as we're aware, of the Zendanione, Gomnam, those the, the, the prisoners without a name, the lost name. You know, who knows how many there are? And uh, that's what we, we want to flesh out. We want to drag the Gomnam, the lost name, into those who've got a name. And uh, speaking to uh, points raised here tonight, the bloggers, the, 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 the Committee for Human Rights reporters, the, 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 the Facebook groups and so on um, in Iran, they have been absolutely invaluable source of information. Yes, verifying them is, is, is so time consuming and painstaking, but it's, uh, it's something that I think we're driven to do because of this thinking that you're alone and that this, this one boss course, the one interrogator is controlling you and that's that's not on. We don't accept that, and that's what we're fighting for. I think we're pretty much out of time. There's just a couple of things to do before we wrap up. One is uh, Cindy, having flown all the way from the States, wants to to finish with a, a kind of closing statement. Yes, if I, can I would. Put it like that. I would. So please I go ahead. That. Okay. Actually, it's it's on paper because after flying for, I haven't slept a whole lot, so <laughs> I'm gonna. I developed it, and I'm going to read it. Um, oh. sure. And the one thing I'd like to say, too, is one of the great privileges of being here is you know, to remind people that Shane's an independent journalist. That's what he does for a living. That's why he was based in the Middle East, and that's why he chose to go to Akhmadawa for a vacation, because it was not far away from him. And he's... You know, was he on active assignment? I've seen Shane work, and any independent journalist can probably relate to this. Shane's always on assignment, really. He's always got a camera around his neck. Did he intend to go to a, in a, into Iran? No, but he's one of yours. And I'm asking for the journalism community to, to speak out. We need, we need that. So I appreciate being here. Um, I would like to thank the Frontline Club for organizing tonight's discussion, the members of the panel and everyone in the audience for being here. You are Shane's colleagues, and I know that Shane will feel, would feel very much at home among you. Ten days from now, Shane, his fiance Sarah Short, and her good friend, his good friend Josh Fatal will mark one long year of detention in Iran. They remain out of the, and away from the world simply because Iran is using them as pawns in a standoff between them and the United States. That is why they are being held without charge and without access to their lawyer. Their treatment is a violation of human rights and Iran's own laws. I do not believe that Iran has anything to gain by continuing to hold Shane Sari and, and Josh. I can only hope Iran's international image to end this injustice and release them. That is why, on behalf of our families, I am calling on the governments in Europe and around the world to take up their case with the Iranian authorities. 
I also hope that you and other journalists among the United States will publicize their case. Shay and Sarah and Josh are not being held because of anything they did, but because of who they are. They are Americans, <coughs> and they are also global citizens. What is happening to them could happen to anyone, and it should not happen to anyone. Please don't let our children's plight be forgotten. Your work will hasten the day that, that they can be rejoined with their families and resume their lives. And I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Well, the final task is to say, to say uh, thank you to our panelists. Um, you've provided a range of perspectives and insights. Not for want of trying, we, we haven't provided uh, a government uh, our government um, voice, um, but other than that, there's a, a rich m a bunch of material for this audience and the online audience to to have a look at online and to to think about over over, over the next uh, period of time. So thanks to Drury, Sina, Cindy, and Mazia for coming, and thanks to you, the audience, for taking the time to to come along tonight. Thank you. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.